Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you are joining us around the globe. Today's webinar is on the state of the wholesale supply chain industry. And I want to welcome you live from the Blue Ridge offices in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my name is Will Haraway. I'm the founder and lead evangelist for Black for. <laughs> <laughs> That is actually not my company name. It is Backbeat Marketing, uh, but that works. That's a good humor. Um, so with me today is Cliff Isaacson, the Executive Vice President of Product Strategy for Blue Ridge. Hello, Cliff. How are you doing? <laughs> hey, Will. Good and to then see we you also again. have Dawn Russell, the Vice President in Charge of Customer Success at Blue Ridge. Hey, Dawn, how are you today? Doing well, Will. How are you doing? I uh, am great. So today... For the third, we'll just introduce that for the third straight year, Blue Ridge asked wholesale supply chain industry leaders about their challenges, how they're thinking about solving them, and how they're dealing with the pace of technological change. The survey of 155 Blue Ridge customers, as well as thousands of NAW Smart Brief, Smart Brief readers, touched on many of the same topics as previous years, but we added a few new ones to capture the changing industry landscape. So with our survey, we, as you can see here, we had uh, our goal was to analyze where we are in the wholesale supply chain industry. And as we said, surveyed 150, uh, 150 Blue, 155 Blue Ridge customers and uh, NAW Smart Brief readers. And the, the, the majority of the respondents uh, were from the C-suite, CEO, CEO, COO, president, et cetera. So, um, some excellent findings and we're going to get into them right now. So the first thing, the first one you'll see is that uncertainty continues to stunt operating margins. Sales grew 8%, but the increased revenue has not brought corresponding margin growth because of the uncertainty around leave time variability, rising transportation costs, inflation from tariffs, economic and or political unrest and new competitive channels, revenue growth, uh, res res revenue growth stalled, we would say. So the second topic or the, the same finding is res the response has been to still hold more inventory. And over 70% are still trying to manage this by keeping more than one month of inventory on hand. Seasonal, slow-moving, and intermittent items are the big offenders this year, but with the trend being stockpile, then discount to move excess, broad assortments are a big differentiator for, dist for distributors, but distributors throwing money and working cap capital into inventory to support it. So the third finding, new item introductions move into the top three. Similar to last year, the top challenges are, one, increasing volatility, volatility from new customers and competition, including commerce, to complex patterns of demand, but new this year, managing new product introductions rose into the top three, displacing managing long lead times from last year's results. And then number four, new technology is being tested to offset the strain. With operating expenses climbing, costs can't be passed on to customers. These higher costs, coupled with the need to compete with price transparent players, are leading companies to try new technologies, such as machine learning, and near and dear to our hearts, price optimization. Yep, for sure. <clears throat> I mean, I think it's uh, chaos is the new norm. Uh, you know, we're still seeing tariff impacts, uh, <clears throat> competitive entrance. I think the Amazon effect is really starting to move from retail into distribution. Uh, it makes sense. Revenue growth uh, is there, but uh, margins and profit growth has stalled. And I think that's associated, uh, you know, we're reading it in other places. Uh, assortments, broad assortments are the differentiator for distributors. And, uh, you know, what do they do to answer that? They throw inventory and working capital at it. And that means you're really going to, you know, stall out uh, on margins, even if you're trying to grow revenues uh, and sales. So I, I really thought it was interesting with the new product introductions um, and that 
popping in there. And, you know, maybe that's coming from acquisitions. I guess we'll talk about it a little bit later. Yeah, we see this among our customers a lot. The The first solution is to throw inventory at the problem, but we're finding that, that that's not always the, uh, the correct way to handle these situations. So we're going to dive into uh, a few of the top challenges that suppliers say that they'll face in the short term. Um, and as you can see on this slide here, uh, we've got the, uh, all three results over the past three years uh, comparatively. Uh, Cliff, w what really kind of stands out to you from these results? Well, I'm, I'm always biased towards uh, product and demand forecasting and science. And I just look at each one of these and say, wow, each one of these uh, adds to complexity and uh, adds to the uh, difficulty in demand forecasting. I mean, look at them, demand volatility, new product introductions, uh, new products where, you know, how do you forecast that? Uh, events and promotions are difficult, uh, notoriously difficult to uh, predict, uh, lift on. So um, all adding to complexity and demand forecasting. To me, that's my takeaway. And we've seen a lot of growth through acquisition, um, which resulted in broader assortments to manage. Uh, we've seen a, a lot of acquisition within food wholesale and HVAC. That's right. Uh, you're looking to manage uh, forecasts sort of at both ends from our customers' customers as well as to the supplier. Uh, we've seen new uh, technology creation among some of our customers to manage these inventories to get earlier and better demand signals across to their suppliers as well. Yeah, for sure. I, um, you know, it, I think uh, we'll talk about it later in the growth in machine learning and some new technologies, uh, hoping to use that to offset some of this volatility. Absolutely. So uh, demand forecasting is hard. Uh, thankfully, the technologies are coming online to uh, make it better and get better forecast accuracy. So we'll get into some of the business trends that are driving some of uh, these decisions in supply chain. Uh, and, and what we saw in, in 2019 and in 2020, this is something that we, we asked about last year, and you can see that um, a, a lot of these have changed the same. You, you see some differentiators in the, uh, the greater increases in cost of items compared to year over year. Um, and you see an increase in the ability to pass on higher costs to customers uh, over this past survey to the, to the previous. Anything else that sort of stands out or can help, can help explain some of these numbers? Well, I mean, <clears throat> distributors are uh, stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, you know, they, they see customer changes and preferences and customer demand volatility uh, uh, going outbound and then inbound. You know, if you're, Sourcing from overseas, you get these tariff issues and you get uh, volatility inbound. And if you're domestic, now you have to deal with uh, not only transportation and trucking capacity constraints, but uh, what well, we're hearing from customers, Don, uh, you're the expert there, but it's, uh, it's labor constraints too. You know, how do you get, uh, how do you process things inbound and outbound from a warehouse when you have labor shortages and uh, uh, We've seen that a kind lot of issues? Of with our customers, uh, looking at you know, transportation and warehouse labor constraints and how do they uh, smooth demand to, to handle variability, uh, manage inbound, outbound coordination. We've seen a, a higher increase in use of the tools that our customers and, and uh, you know, other people in this industry have in front of them uh, in order to use uh, receipt projections to back into labor needs, uh, to look at you know, dock appointments of all of that, uh, to ensure that they're able to take in the, the inventory as it comes across. Ah, that's right. That's good stuff. Yeah, how do you uh, predict the future? Well, first thing you do is uh, do some demand sensing and figure out what's happening with demand as fast as you can as early as possible. What are some leading indicators of demand? So, interesting. So, moving on, um, we've got... As you can see, the chart showing current days of supply on hand amongst the respondents. And you can see here that only 3.4% could meet all their demand, and 24.8% fell short more than 4% of the time. Um, what does this tell you guys? Uh, and, and again, you can look at the curve. Um, very, very similar, but, but, but also still, still quite volatile. Yeah, I mean, there's danger in averages, uh, but... Underlying this, if you look at some of the other uh, trends that are being published, 
I think it's broader assortments and what happens with broader assortments uh, for distributors. If you're going to compete with these larger assortments, you end up with a lot of C&D items. So I'm guessing tied with that is uh, the C&D items, uh, they're slow movers, there's intermittent demand. And hey, so what happens with that? You have to uh, have these uh, inventory investments, you're throwing uh, dollars at inventory uh, and you end up with these uh, days of supply that are way out there. Uh, we see a lot of uh, people that are holding on to similar days of supply across their assortment. And this is mm -hmm. where, you know, tailoring these strategies among your fast movers and your slow movers is really critical. Um, tailoring these assortments based on the volatility of these items to the forecasts that you have available is really what we find is working well for, for most of our customers. Yeah, the broad brush strokes of uh, application yeah. don't necessarily cut it. So that makes a lot of sense that you really get targeted in uh, demand classification. And we see a lot of that coming up hmm. later in some of these slides that uh, demand that the uh, classification of these items between fast movers, slow movers and items that are important to your customers is critical. Good point. And moving forward, we'll t we've taken a look at the percentage of demand that couldn't be filled by inventory. And you can see the results there um, starting to re starting to reduce, obviously, from 28 on into uh, 2018 into 2020. Um, Don Cliff, what can you what can you tell me here? Well, it looks like progress last year and then we gave it up. So we're uh, we're back at um, uh, stock outs. Uh, uh, so looks like some improvements last year and then uh, maybe a backward slide. And a lot of this has to do with the volatility that we've been talking mm. about. We've got a lot of volatility in lead times. Um, this requires not only placing the right amount to purchase, but at the right times. Because you know if you don't place it at the right time, you're definitely gonna have lost sales and stock outs. Right. Um, this also comes into play when we're talking about uh, a lot of collaboration with suppliers. We've seen that as a, as a trend across our customers this year. Um, how do they get early demand signals to their suppliers to ensure that they're able to meet the demands that they have from their customers. Uh, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, with capacity constraints at the supplier side, they want to do production planning. So exactly. the distributors have the data, right? Uh, so it, that makes sense with uh, integration. That's there, right. There's Great been point. a lot of run on suppliers with people wanting to stockpile inventory ahead of tariffs and, and other right. constraints. So right. making sure that you're able to get your inventory and getting that signal into your supplier earlier you know, allows you to be a little bit safer. Well, it's interesting because uh, I can see that integration actually maybe scoring points with the supplier. You mm -hmm. have a better relationship with Absolutely. the supplier and, uh, you know, they're going to want to work with distributors who are sending them early demand signals. So Absolutely. that makes sense. And moving forward, diving deep here today on a Wednesday, how do you, the respondent, measure supply chain planning and inventory optimization? This is obviously a Right, it, right big home run for us. So uh, we see improved accuracy, more autonomous operations with less manual intervention, supply on hand. Cliff, what went down and why? Yeah, exactly. Of course, this, uh, you know, my uh, bias towards technology and solutions. Uh, so it's music to my ears. Uh, so my takeaway, biased perhaps, is that, uh, you know, I love seeing distributors are using uh, uh, more, uh, exception-based processes, I would guess, and that's why they're tracking uh, metrics like less manual intervention, uh, and of course, measuring forecast accuracy. Um, you know, Don, you can speak to the uh, perhaps uh, less efficacy of some of the other metrics. I really think improved forecast accuracy is a good measure. What's interesting is the increase of importance of fill rates versus turns. Um, you know, we like to say you can turn yourself out of business here. <laughs> you know, the fastest way to increase turns is to run out of inventory, which is not always what we want to do. Um, it's, it's important. It's, an, it's a leading indicator, but it's not always the most important indicator of your inventory health. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, what you measure matters. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so our next question, do your current processes and tools provide capabilities to strategize? And as you can see, no seems to be the <laughs> <laughs> the leading answer there. But, uh, so it's 64% of those folks that need more strategic process and tools. So where could maybe something like IBP fit in? 
Yeah, great point. Uh, yeah, I think we'll see it later on with uh, interest and even um, applicability of machine learning, but it's not just machine learning. Uh, I believe what's driving this is, you know, exactly what you're pointing out. People have started to solve the tactical problems of supply chain planning. More and more people are uh, using sophisticated tools uh, to do uh, tactical supply chain planning. And now they're looking at things like uh, addressing their SNOP processes and really looking out more longer term, uh, larger planning horizons. Uh, and that is all about uh, SNOP and, and having a balance between sales forecasts and uh, operations that actually have to, you know, do that inventory investment to support it. This is where we marry technology with what's, uh, what's we're, what we're going to extract from the group. Right. What do what do we what does the group know that the technology does not know? Wait. So you're saying it's not all about the technology? It's not all about okay. the technology. Just, but uh, <laughs> sometimes I need to hear that. Sometimes. <laughs> in, in looking at these, we've we've done several um, successful SNOP implementations this year, and working uh, with our customers um, on their SNOP processes, um, and we've seen major improvements in forecast accuracy. You know, we see a lot of of um, problems in, in communication between the sales team and the replenishment teams. We'll put items on promotion and not tell the replenishment team, then we're going to have stock out. So how do we get all of that information in one place where we can start measuring our accuracy and working together as a group to understand what we're going to do with our inventory over the next three to six months? Interesting. Maybe that's also what's driving this uh, increased visibility to forecast accuracy metrics mm -hmm. and using that as a, a key KPI. And here's a good one for you. How have you, or pardon me, have you achieved last year's business goal? Uh, and, and just a subset of that, what are, what are your goals and metrics to make sure you hit them? Are you all rowing in the same direction to get there? Are there disparate goals within the organization? Uh, it seems like there's a huge potential to align here and, and stop throwing inventory dollars, right, Cliff? Yeah, I mean, uh, I looked at this and, you know, I had... Uh, it could go one of two ways, or maybe it's both, uh, you know, averages. Uh, but either distributors are setting ridiculously high goals and then being uh, continuously disappointed at not uh, achieving them this year again, or uh, more likely the culprit is, uh, you know, they're just, they're uh, squeezed between a rock and a hard place. They get demand volatility. Uh, suppliers are changing costs. There's tariffs coming in. Uh, they have constrained uh, uh, warehouse capacity and labor capacity and transportation capacity. And I think that's all probably contributing to failing to reach the goals that they wanted. So uh, that's my guess. Yeah, we're, we're a strong proponent of creating scorecards and sharing them across the organization. If, if, if these are the KPIs that, that we're rowing together on and these are the numbers that matter, how do we trickle those numbers down to the lowest level of the organization so that they can see the impact that they're having on these KPIs and tracking to them on a regular basis so everyone understands their progress and the company's progress towards these goals? Yeah, that's a great point. Alignment on KPIs across the organization uh, uh, good point. And you can pick your KPI, right? You can just you can decide what matters to you and your organization, but at least sharing those across the organization and breaking them down to every level within the organization makes everyone feel a part of reaching those goals. Mm, and I would guess uh, you're right. If different parts of the organization have chosen different KPIs, they're probably going to fail on all. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't laugh. That's uh, you know, not a good thing. And our next question in the survey was, what are your barriers to achieving business goals? And you can see the, the two previous years that we had that question involved. And uh, the numbers are, are, are pretty stagnant, actually, pretty similar. Oh, yeah. That uh, uh, the rock in the shoe, slow and intermittent demand items. It's a challenging from a science perspective. Uh, uh, I like a challenge. Uh, I think we've done some very interesting things there. Uh, it's still a problem and we need to uh, keep working with uh, our customers to solve that demand forecast. But there's certainly other ones uh, that are barriers uh, that look familiar. Uh, event promotions forecasting, another one that's really hard to do, get uh, good forecast accuracy on. Seasonal profiles, yeah. Uh, still a It's interesting challenge. to see integrated business planning dropping down a little bit. 
Yeah, maybe yeah. people are seeing their, you know, we see it with our customer base with implementations and seeing success, uh, statistically relevant improvements in long-term forecast accuracy from IBP implementations. Maybe we're seeing it broadly across distributors. We've seen improvements of up to 15% in forecast accuracy in a relatively very short amount of time uh, based on these IBP integrations. Um, getting that, extracting that information from the sales team early only helps you know, inventory positions across the organization. Interesting. In our next question, we asked our wholesalers to, to, uh, to look at their sales growth versus inventory growth. I think you can see here, it's, it, Cliff, it's, it's getting a little better, incrementally better. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, the growth is there. Uh, revenue growth continues, uh, and inventory investment, of course, uh, goes with it. Um, uh, so I was trying to look at this and go, well, why is revenue growth still there, but smaller than the prior year? Um, so I was wondering, maybe the hidden statistic here is stockouts. If you're uh, throwing money at a problem, you're doing broad brush strokes on uh, inventory investments. And uh, if you're doing that, you know, uh, Don mentioned earlier, uh, if you're not being very targeted and specific in how you invest in inventory, you're going to get some stockouts. Uh, and so maybe that's what's uh, capping out some of the revenue growth uh, that coincides with, hey, you're still growing, but maybe you could actually be growing faster. We also see a lot of um, our customers looking to try to analyze deals that are offered uh, mm -hmm. within, with, from their suppliers. Um, we also, we've, we've done a couple of podcasts recently with some folks that have a culture around these deals. Um, they really add to the bottom line. So if you're looking to, to eke out margin on, what, on your inventory purchases, the best way to do that is through any deals that are offered from your suppliers. And we've seen um, organizations that uh, you know, apply a, a, a format around this where they're able to actually cold call their suppliers and achieve 27% um, deal rates with cold calls to suppliers. And 70% of some of these folks' deals are generated, self-generated, right? So if you've got a promotion coming up on an item, you know you're going to increase your purchase on that from your supplier. Why not try to negotiate and get a better deal? That's right. That's true uh, supply chain maturity. Mm -hmm. You've gone from being uh, reactive to truly proactive. You're looking for uh, these forward buys and actually going out to your suppliers to, to find the best ones and, and get them. So the next question we asked um, about the forecasting and planning challenges addressed through increased inventory. So what do we see through this data, the biggest things that are squeezing wholesalers? Uh, well, it's, um, you know, it's the, uh, the middle ground. You've got uh, volatile and changing customer preferences and then these supplier constraints. Uh, so I'm seeing that in, well, let's look at collaboration. And we're actually seeing that both in supply chain planning. Uh, you know, Don, you mentioned uh, taking these forward looking uh, forecasts on purchase orders and getting them back to your suppliers uh, to minimize volatility because you're actually letting them uh, plan around that for capacity constraints. Uh, and the other one was new product introductions. Yeah. Uh, you know, let's look at, uh, using uh, inventory management, inventory optimization to address these new, uh, new product introduction challenges in forecasting demand. We like to think of new product introductions as the growth in the future of your company. And, you know, we, we often talk about putting a, uh, a process and a plan around new product introductions. Do you have a playbook for your team huh. where they're actually, you know, babysitting that demand and looking at those, those items? How are they modeling them against other items that you have that you think are, that they're going to uh, perform similarly? Um, we talk about, is this item replacing an old one, right? So having right. these processes and, and, uh, and playbooks in place for your inventory investment team to really review and keep an eye on these uh, new items and how they're performing is key. Yeah, and it's, and it's so important too. You know, the worst thing possible is to t get these new products that are uh, really differentiating you in the market and then you stock out on them. Absolutely. Uh, or you don't plan appropriately. And, you know, it's not just stocking out uh, across the board, but really appropriately managing uh, inventory investment 
uh, closest to the customer. Absolutely. You know, that means uh, uh, different echelons of the supply chain and uh, different locations that need to be stocked correctly. We see a broad brush ap approach to these uh, uh, new product introductions a lot of time. And there's a set number of we're going to purchase at this rate for this many months. And really what we think is we need to look back at some of our similar items and how these are performing and get an idea of what we need to purchase in. Uh, so that we're not just stockpiling new inventory before we know how this item is going to perform. That's a great segue into our next question. Which of these inventory planning capabilities do you currently have and currently use? And I think you're starting to see when 2019 versus 2020, as far as our results, that, uh, that you're starting to see a lot of the, uh, a, a lot of these solutions being implemented and, and making a difference. Yep, you can see improvements uh, across the board on things that we definitely advocate uh, in the marketplace. Uh, not just getting to product location differentiation, but even uh, doing collaboration and getting better at a customer level. Um, uh, I always think it's very interesting. You look at that, 25% say uh, not doing nothing. Yep. Like I, that's always, to me, a surprise. Um, uh, doing nothing's not an option. That is not an option. Uh, not if you want to stay competitive. Uh, maybe it's the have versus have nots where, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to see, uh, perhaps respondents at 25%, but it'll be a shrinking, uh, crowd as people get, uh, uh, pushed out of the marketplace by people who are investing in these kind of, uh, inventory planning options. <clears throat> and I think the other one is maybe it's reflective of, uh, people are getting better at the uh, supply chain planning side, and now they're looking for things like longer-term collaboration with suppliers and customers using IBP and uh, SNOP processes. And, and definitely a, a nice increase in dynamically uh, evaluating plans based on demand. That's, that's yeah. something that you're uh, a very nice increase there. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, volatility means the plan changes all the time. That's right. Absolutely. So. And understanding those cost impacts of, of changing service levels on items is critical, right? That's an investment you're going to make to increase it. Um, where does that investment make sense within your organization across your lines? So looking at some of the more advanced technologies being used in uh, wholesale distribution and supply chain planning, uh, we asked what percentage of companies are using machine learning techniques for forecasting? And uh, you can see that it's, it's, it's creeping up, you know, certainly creeping up uh, versus uh, year over year over the past 12 months. Yep. I mean, it's great. Uh, we're, people are starting to actually see the value. It's not just buzz anymore and, uh, and buzzwords of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, people are actually seeing value from it. Uh, I love it. Because um, I've argued that for a long time, there were a lot of vendors out there and it was, uh, it was a hammer looking for nails. And I think uh, in this case, uh, you know, there's a number of areas where we found real results uh, with customers uh, around, you know, it, it intermittent demand items, uh, actually even the regular demand items uh, and uh, your A items, machine learning is improving uh, on forecast accuracy. Uh, and demand forecasting, but we're also starting to see some real results with uh, some of these technologies, machine learning in particular, around new item uh, introductions mm -hmm. and attribute matching, and then uh, uh, price optimization, certainly uh, of value there. Uh, but that's a whole other topic, Absolutely. I think. <laughs> I, th I think it becomes more approachable, right? I think it's it's been something that felt like it was out of uh, uh, companies reach before and you needed uh, um, data scientists in order to take advantage of it. But as this uh, technology becomes more readily accessible within the technologies that we're using uh, every day, we're starting to see the impact and the lift and it becomes something more than a buzzword or something that's out of uh, the everyday person's hands. Yeah, we talked already about uh, uh, the damage of doing nothing. And I think uh, we're going to start to see, I think, uh, uh, the the real mandate where if you're not using machine learning, you can't survive. Absolutely. You can't succeed, uh, especially as, you know, intermittent demand items grow, you get long tails of assortment. Uh, people start looking at things like price optimization to get more margins and profits out of existing inventory. So, uh, you know, hopefully we'll reverse those trends and people will start growing revenue and then subsequently also growing profits 
uh, as these things come online. I think everyone's going to have to use every tool in the box, right, to, to eke out the, the, the margins um, as we move forward. Uh, you know, we talked a lot about forward buy opportunities, um, and we see our customers taking advantage of that everywhere they can ahead of tariffs, um, looking at how, do they, how they can uh, use every opportunity that they have to increase uh, margins. That's right. You know, you've mentioned uh, uh, forward buys. There is cost of service analysis mm -hmm. uh, to see how you uh, uh, get better profitability through better inventory management. You look at price optimization to get higher margins and, and start shaping demand. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't mean that the existing demand forecasting techniques have gone away. It's machine learning that's been added to the toolbox to, right. to make it better. Always the last piece in in a uh, in an analytics uh, stack is the you know more prescriptive piece of this, which That's is where right. we get into with uh, more machine learning and, and AI. So, how do we use, or how do you use these uh, this data? Um, and obviously, we're going to be providing you with the full report. Uh, at the conclusion of this of, of of the webinar, we'll be sending it out to everyone. But here are a few a few key questions you can ask. Does your system provide collaboration with your suppliers? That's that's certainly uh, certainly important. Does your solution classify demand and address intermittent demand forecasting? Does your solution provide cost of service analysis? Um, and in terms of leveraging new tech. Um, customer willingness to pay, customer level forecasts, promotion and events management, that was a big part of uh, a lot of the data that we collected there. Uh, certainly competitor analysis, what are, you know, what are, how do you stay ahead and, and, and stay competitive? And then customer and supplier collaboration. These are, the, these are the questions that you should be asking as you move forward within your organization to, to improve your processes. Right, and it's what we're really looking at uh, to stay ahead of the curve. You know, we mentioned machine learning, but there's plenty of other technologies uh, that we're bringing to bear. And these are the items that we're looking at. You know, how can you uh, measure customer willingness to pay and get away from cost plus? Uh, you know, getting away from your supplier mandating uh, what your prices ought to be uh, and actually using the data that a distributor has. You know, it, it, distributors sit on a lot of very valuable data and that's the new, uh, the new currency is this data that you can use. And promotions and events management, you know, uh, there's a lot of interesting things we're finding with customers uh, around uh, better uh, events management and, and predicting the lift from different promotion activities. Competitive analysis for sure. Uh, not just positioning and following uh, competitive price moves, but actually figuring out which competitors matter and which ones you ought to be positioning against. Uh, and then the customer and supplier collaboration is not just uh, SNOP processes, but I, uh, I can see that customers are seeing a lot of value here, even on the supply chain planning side with collaboration, uh, particularly with suppliers. Yeah, Cliff, I think the, the, underlying, the underlying theme throughout this has been collaboration, right? Whether that's uh, collaborating with your supplier, collaborating within your organization, but using every bit of data that you can to put into your plan uh, to, to be as accurate as you possibly can be. That's right. And, uh, and part of that is uh, using uh, the making best use of technology, making of course. Making best I'll... use of Yeah, of course. <laughs> So summarizing the key findings of, of the study and, and, and Cliff and Dawn, please just, just jump in a, as we go through these, but we'll start with number one in that uncertainty continues to stunt operating margins. And we see that wholesale distributors continue to struggle with inventory planning and understanding how to optimize what they hold to meet the shifting consumer demands. Um, how to best manage products on hand continues to be complicated, though, by trends in the economy. Things like rising transportation costs, supplier and labor, labor constraints, and the, the big T word of 2019, the tariffs, as well as inflation. The second key finding, the response that we're seeing is, is that it still just to hold more inventory, no matter the, what the challenge or cause for concern, the typical response continues to be to hold more inventory, then discount the excess inventory, which can hinder companies from achieving their business goals. In particular, seasonal items and those that are slow, 
moving or obsolete, you know, they continue to be significant roadblocks for the majority of wholesale distributors. There's a delicate balance between stockpiling inventory and then, you know, the carrying costs to hold it. And a lot of folks don't have the tools at their hands to understand that balance. And I think finding better tools to, to manage that. There are times when you need to, to, to purchase ahead and, and stockpile some items. But understanding the cost, the relative cost to holding that inventory is critical. Oh, yeah. And you look at the balance sheet and you see how much is actually tied up in, in mm -hmm. working capital yeah. in this uh, inventory. And, you know, that's got to have an impact on, you know, it, you know, hey, you'll get revenue growth, but you're not going to get it with profitability. Yeah, and if you're looking to increase your line, you need, the, you need the, the capital to do it, right? And if you've got it tied up into, you know stockpiling a lot of stuff in your warehouse, you're not going to be able to increase your, in, to spread it across your line. Yeah. And you already mentioned it. We're seeing uh, some of our most successful customers uh, really growing through acquisition. And this is a great way of doing it. You leverage technology, you do inventory optimization, you do better demand forecasting, you free up some of this working capital and you start uh, doing acquisitions or you expand out your product line, you expand your assortment and it adds to your differentiation. So, uh, the successful become even more successful. So, Okay, and then number three, you guys touched on this a few slides ago, but we have an opportunity to really dig into it here. What about the fact that new item introductions have moved into the, the top three? Yeah, it's another one of those differentiators for uh, distributors, you know, keep introducing unique items uh, that really distinguish them, uh, but you need that technology. Yeah. Uh, probably sound like a broken drum, but... <laughs> Uh, it's, it's difficult to forecast, but you want to get it right. These new product introductions are important and you just don't want to stock out on them, but you also don't want to uh, tie up too much working capital in these new items either. And that's where these playbooks come into effect and, and really measuring what you're putting in, right? We've got a lot of customers that are looking at skew rationalization, right? What, as we're bringing new items in, what are some of the items we may need to get rid of? Right. What do we, and, you know, we want to in, increase the line, but we want to have things that are moving through the line. So that's right. And then number four, we see that people are trying new things. New technology is being tested to offset the strain and that's advanced supply chain analytics and technologies, things like artificial intelligence, machine learning. These are all gaining traction. We see that within the results. Uh, the 2020 survey revealed an increase in companies using these tools as well as those interested in implementing them specifically for forecasting and supply chain planning. And it's volatility in economic conditions and customer demand makes using tools, things like something near and dear to Cliff's heart, price optimization, scenario evaluation, and forecast reconciliation a critical way for distributors to gain an advantage over competition. Absolutely, I'm not gonna argue that one. Uh, and You're we're not? seeing it, no, no absolutely not. Uh, you know, and, and it's not just machine learning. You know, it, it's part of a toolkit and we're seeing it across the board. It's improved forecast accuracy. It's uh, adding new uh, uh, methods and approaches to forecast, uh, demand forecasting and price optimization, new product introduction, uh, a collaborative framework and a platform, a cloud-based platform to allow collaboration, not only within uh, your four walls between sales and operations, but extending that out uh, to your customers, extending it up to your uh, suppliers. Um, that's all helping with those things like demand visibility, uh, improved demand visibility and leading indicators of demand and managing these capacity constraints that are uh, on your supplier side. We've seen a, a lot of increase in that uh, early signal um, notification on demand. Um, again, I talked about some of our customers investing in technology where they can get that early signal from their customers um, as quickly as possible. Um, also looking at um, intent from internet searches and things of that nature to try and get that signal as early as possible. Thank you, Don. And we want to thank you guys for uh, joining us today. And, and, and now is the time where you absorb what you've learned and ask us a few questions. So um, we have a few that have come in here. And I'm going to direct this to uh, both you guys. And you can just sort of dive in. Is there any concern that, uh, that a number of wholesalers are reducing? 
meaning buyers are going to direct to their source and cutting out the middleman. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting question. Uh, uh, I actually see the opposite. Um, the advantage distributors have is uh, they have a broad assortment and uh, they have the opportunity to actually uh, uh, probably more capable, given my experience in uh, with manufacturers of selling direct to consumer. So it's actually distributors uh, that are seeing a huge growth in e-commerce channels and sales directly okay. to customers. Now, you know, that being said, uh, that accentuates the need for better inventory management and demand forecasting because that can be uh, highly volatile. Uh, but if you get that right uh, and you do things, uh, you know, once again, my bias, if you do things like uh, better price optimization and measuring willingness to pay, uh, you can actually succeed uh, and distributors can actually reach in and cut out the retail middleman uh, and become uh, more of the model of a broader assortment than the narrow offerings of a, of a retailer. Um, and uh, I think that's the advantage there. So maybe it won't be a shrinking distribution market. Maybe it's gonna be a growing distribution market. And uh, the numbers support it. Uh, you know, it's, it's have and have not certainly uh, with the Granger of the world growing very rapidly, being very successful by leveraging technologies uh, as well as better processes uh, in, in distribution uh, and selling more directly to customers. Uh, so uh, that'll be an interesting one uh, remains to be seen. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, we really appreciate that. Thanks for participating. And we have another one here. And uh, as the point guard of the group here, I'm going to, I'm going to distribute this over to Dawn. <laughs> Can you explain a bit more about the IBP process and how you would use customer information and forecasting in inventory planning? Absolutely. You can take, uh, information in from your customers about what they think their demand is going to be and incorporate it into your demand planning. Um, you know, this is also a way to start trying to hold uh, everyone in this process a little bit more accountable. Um, uh, in this process and looking at forecast accuracy among your customer level forecasting as well as uh, your forecasting for your demand at your, uh, at your suppliers. Excellent. Excellent. Cliff, anything to add? No, it just uh, it makes sense. <laughs> okay. Well, here's one for you, because I know you're getting antsy over there. We got we to gotta <laughs> feed Cliff the ball. Um, Give me the ball. That's right. Where does machine learning and AI fit on the Blue Ridge product roadmap? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a interesting. personal question. Yeah, that's right. A personal question. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, it's not just uh, um, smoke and mirrors. We've actually found results already. It's actually uh, part of the product and uh, it, it's more than just a roadmap item. Uh, we found real results. It's actually st statistically, ah, statistically significant improvements uh, in demand forecast using machine learning techniques. So we're actually uh, already getting that into the product. It's, it's not just a roadmap item, but in the future beyond that, uh, I see more uh, R&D efforts on our data science team, uh, which has the expertise that's already been proven out in machine learning techniques to expand it out uh, to other techniques, artificial intelligence techniques, and applying it to things like, uh, you know, we're doing research R&D projects uh, with, with uh, a number of customers, uh, actually, uh, in new product introductions, in promotion optimization, demand lift, forecasting and some other areas. And then once we prove that out at customers uh, using real data, um, that's when we start rolling it into the product. And that's what I see, uh, you know, we've seen the results already with, uh, with customer data and now we're rolling it out. So that's our, that's our roadmap application is getting it out that to, there to everybody. I mean, that's the advantage of a cloud-based application right. is everybody sees benefit uh, from improvements. Thank you, Cliff. And now back over to you, Don. Are you seeing similar trends with retail customers as you do with distribution and wholesale customers? Yeah, even more so, uh, especially with uh, price optimization and supply chain planning. Uh, price optimization being near and dear to uh, Cliff's heart, if you, if you want to expand on that a little That's bit. That's right. Uh, you know, I, I already mentioned that there's a large growth in e-commerce channels and direct to co uh, consumer. Uh, so you can imagine that retailers are really feeling the pain and you need to be even better at inventory positioning, inventory management, 
Uh, and if you're a retailer that also has some uh, distribution centers, you have to be good at this multi-echelon inventory optimization, managing your inventory uh, upstream as well. Uh, and price optimization, you know, uh, wow, there's been great adoption in price optimization on the retail side because you can't live without it. It's become table stakes. Uh, so uh, what distributors are starting to feel now, retailers have felt for a while. And we're, uh, you know, we're addressing those issues uh, and challenges and actually adding value on the retail side too. Now, I love this question. Um, what is a reasonable forecast accuracy? It's in the eye of the beholder a little bit, isn't it? What is reasonable forecast accuracy? So it really varies by industry vertical. Um, it depends on how you're tracking forecast and, accuracy. Oh, we see a quite point. a bit of difference across uh, different organizations. Um, with the way that we track forecast accuracy, we say between 95 and 105. Um, but those numbers don't make any sense if you're looking at different forecast accuracy methodologies. So I, all of that really is relative to how you are tracking it within your organization. What is that, your calculation? That's right. And uh, what industry you're in, what customers you serve. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I quickly come to mind thinking of uh, auto parts distributors. Oh, yeah. And if you're, you're a clientele, uh, is not uh, is older models in your install base, you might be really struggling with these intermittent demand items. You have mostly largely uh, what most people would consider C and D items. So your forecast accuracy is going to be a struggle. It's actually the advantage we have with so many customers in distribution is uh, that we can do benchmarking. Yeah. You know that we can measure forecast accuracy and uh, compare it to your peer group which is, you know, this is the, the danger of averages, mm -hmm. uh, which is forecast accuracy compared to all other distributors uh, might be a tough uh, road to hoe, or you're doing much better than the average distributor, but it really is meaningless because your peer group is outpacing you. There's some items where this is, is less relevant as well. When we get out way into these lumpy and intermittent items, right, there's, you know, some of these items aren't even worth forecasting at that point. We're right. looking at, at how much inventory do we need to have on hand, right? A min, a max, something to that effect, rather than looking at trying to average out a forecast for those items. Yeah, I will say, I mean, it's a moving target too. Yep. As you get better, uh, as, uh, as customers get better at uh, getting over the hurdle of tactical uh, supply chain management and demand forecasting and start implementing these collaborative uh, uh, solutions like uh, better SNOP processes and leveraging technology, um, you know, the target moves because now their expectations of better forecast accuracy go up and up. Uh, and then you start to do better things, uh, you know, uh, better processes and technologies around new product introductions, promotion and event forecasting, uh, the bar gets higher. So uh, these are, we're getting a lot of great questions here. Again, thank you to everyone. We, we really appreciate the participation. And here we have what's basically a review and a question, and we appreciate that feedback. And it goes, this is an excellent discussion of supplier, uh, of supply and, and distribution. Thank you for that. But we are now facing a new phenomenon with China and supply chain disruption where the original manufacturer resides. Do we apply the same principles with these new supply chain challenges? Uh, the only constant is change and chaos. So, um, uh, yeah, we're starting to see that uh, in distribution where you need to look for alternate suppliers. Uh, we, we've seen the tariff challenge uh, existing for, um, for a while. And I think this is just another nuance to it where uh, you're impacting uh, what is available from suppliers and looking for alternate suppliers. So if you're not challenged by uh, not challenged enough by uh, transportation and uh, labor constraints domestically, uh, probably want to look at it because maybe it's not as challenging as, uh, as these longer term uh, supplier management issues uh, overseas. Um, but uh, I think our, our customers, you know, Don, you can speak to this. Uh, when you're sourcing from overseas, you have already very long lead time. So uh, you've probably got a stockpile of inventory uh, based on volatility of that demand. Um, uh, so it, it'd be interesting to see how you manage alternate suppliers because if they're still overseas, there's still volatility. Yeah, I mean, we've seen longer lead times getting longer, right? So, you know, the, the fact that we've seen these huge increases in demand ahead of these tariffs or ahead of, you know, these products coming out, 
uh, your 120 day lead time has gone to 150, your 30 day lead time from Mexico has gone to 55 days, right? So having uh, a methodology in place that can track that lead time variability and understand where you need to back your ordering up to, right? Like we said, it's not just about how much you order, it's about when you order. Yeah. And it's a, it's another argument for a better collaboration with your suppliers Absolutely. because uh, you want to uh, have a great relationship with yeah. them and you want them to understand that you are trying to get uh, more inventory from them if you're losing uh, inventory or, or supply from uh, alternate suppliers. Uh, you know, if, if you have two overseas suppliers and China's going away, you want to let that other supplier know as soon as possible. And if you have a great relationship, if you're already uh, getting them uh, forecasted purchase orders and that goes up, you want that in their hands as quickly as possible. And uh, IBP and SNOP processes are another important way of doing that because right. you're collaborating long term and leading into a new year, a new uh, planning period, you would want them to know that you're looking at uh, alternates and trying to uh, minimize that risk of uh, supplier volatility that you have to deal with now. Okay, and thank you for that very topical question, and we really appreciate that. Um, th surprised we didn't get a coronavirus question today, but that's all right. <laughs> Topic of the day, du jour. But uh, back over to Dawn, and again, thank you guys. Uh, keep sending them in if you've got them. Uh, is, the value, is there value to try and work with your retail customers and obtain their POS data, point of, point of sale data, um, as input to a wholesaler forecasting system? Uh, the closer you can get to demand, the better. The more detailed information uh, and data you can get, the better. Uh, and we certainly work with distributors uh, that are giving us invoice level data, which is customer level data. So the extension of that is, uh, you know, look at uh, the total demand coming into a distributor. Uh, you know, some portion of that um, is invoice level data that represents sales directly to customers, uh, especially as that e-commerce or direct to uh, customer sales grows. But then there's the indirect channel, which is through retailers. And if they can reach in and get uh, customer level demand forecasts from them as well, um, you know, think about an invoice uh, that's uh, an in indirect demand. It's, uh, it's buffered. Uh, so if you can get to a truer demand signal, uh, it helps. Um, uh, but we're already seeing that even at the invoice uh, level data uh, without even getting to, to POS data uh, in that you can see customer relationships, you can identify or, uh, customer price sensitivity and actually measure how uh, demand forecasts are changing at the customer level. And that in and of itself is valuable before you even get the POS data. As well as affinity. <laughs> oh, that's right. So. Um, it's a price optimization topic uh, to some degree, uh, but measuring affinities between products and what customers are purchasing uh, is a valuable way of uh, uh, leveraging the inventory you have and increasing profitability because uh, uh, you can see that halo effect and you can yeah. make product recommendations on uh, similar items that are being purchased together, especially the ones that have higher margins. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're getting close to the bottom of the hour here, so we're gonna we're gonna ask maybe two more questions here. Uh, so, the next one is: What percentage of clients are currently using point of sale data? I'd say uh, a small percentage yeah. because for distributors, they're really focused on uh, invoice level data, and they're getting enough value. Uh, you could look at a, a return curve. Uh, where um, they're getting uh, pretty high in the returns just with invoice level data. And some customers, you know, given the volume of data, are just giving, giving us aggregated demand and now talking to us about getting invoice level data. We're so, seeing an increase in the number of customers that want to get us invoice level data. Uh, obviously, as you, you mentioned, getting as close to the demand, you know, the true uh, line item demand as, as we possibly can gives us more insights into the data and also gives us a better um, way to look in, and slice and dice the data as we want to, you know, step through it and even in analytics. Right. So the, the short answer is um, a small percentage uh, have POS data. Uh, but they're getting, you know, the step one is get us invoice level data Absolutely. Uh, and use that uh, to do affinity analysis and customer level demand and custom measuring customer level willingness to pay. Uh, and then you can worry about getting further up the curve of value. Yeah, we, we can extrapolate a lot of that from that invoice level data without the POS data to begin with. But as you start getting hungry for those insights, uh, it leads into a deeper dive. 
We got one final question as we're at 2.57 Eastern time here. But um, so we've talked a lot about retailers, distributors, wholesalers, but, but what benefits will manufacturers see from this data and research? Uh, interesting. Uh, so we actually have uh, manufacturing and supplier customers uh, that are seeing value as well. I think the closer you are to data, uh, the more you can see valuable insights and the closer you are to cons uh, customer demand, speaking of point of sale data and then uh, invoice uh, level data, manufacturers are seeing a lot of value from this. And certainly manufacturers are doing the same thing that distributors are, which is uh, going to e-commerce channels, selling direct to uh, customer. And uh, that's why they're seeing uh, some interesting things as well. And we'll start to see growth in that market uh, as you know, they, they certainly have the same needs that retailers and distributors have in terms of inventory management uh, and uh, price optimization and certainly collaboration uh, through SNOP processes. Thank you, Cliff, and thank you, Dawn, uh, and thank you to everyone that joined us today. So just in conclusion, uh, you'll receive a hard copy of the 2020 Wholesale Report in your email boxes. So thank you for that. And uh, as a conclusion, we'll tell you that what we've learned from, from the data is that successful wholesale distribution organizations are using supply chain planning software to their advantage and leveraging best practices such as demand forecasting of intermittent demand items, price optimization, machine learning, scenario planning, cost of service evaluation, multi-echelon inventory optimization, and forecast reconciliation to better manage inventory and meet their business goals. While the majority of those who responded to the survey still don't have the systems or tools in place to optimize their operations, we are seeing that, the val that many realize that the value these types of investments yield. Those looking to improve revenue and better control costs understand that they need to get a better handle on inventory results. The use of supply chain planning software coupled with price optimization, better demand forecasting and integrated business plan technology will improve service and revive margins. Investing in data analysis tools and other technologies will put companies ahead of the competition, particularly as these economic uncertainties that we've discussed today continue to create chaos and shift customer demand. So on behalf of Cliff Isaacson and Dawn, we wanna thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Will Haraway with Backbeat Marketing and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Will.